Hi, this is outdoors writer David Figura, and tis the season, the um, season to catch salmon on the fall salmon run. Um, I'm here with two well-known fishing guides, um, David Rocky Rockwell and um, Rick Smith. And um, we're going to talk about what you need to know to catch one during the fall run. Um, let's start off with what do you need to have to get started, like equipment? Um, Rick, let's start off, say for the spin casters. Uh, spin casting wise, I mean, you can get away with like a medium action spin rod. And, uh, you know, typically you want to get like a spin reel, like in a size 40. And, you know, for the line you want to use, you know, somewhere around like 12 to 15 pound test for the main line. And you can use for like your leader about uh, 10 or eight pound test. So, I mean, you can get an inexpensive combo to get started out with just that series right there. What works best as far as bait or lures? Uh, for the kings, especially for a spin fisherman, which it's not very widely used, um, you know, rappellas with a single hook or a spin bait will work very well. Um, using a conjunction with the river currents and letting it swing down through the pools. It can entice a strike by a king. Um, so, I mean, if you can use egg sacs or even plastic eggs when the eggs are in the system, that will work. But especially in the early part of the season, I'd definitely be using like a spinner with a single hook or a floating rappella with uh, a single hook rigged on it. So that'd be okay. the best one for it to spin. Okay. And Rocky, what about the fly fishermen? Well, I, I always recommend a longer ride for this fishery because these are very big fish. It helps you fight them. Uh, the switch rod, 10 and a half to 12 feet long is very common now. It's easy to roll cast, easy to mend the line. You get a longer presentation and you have a two-handed handle. So when you're fighting a fish, you can brace the uh, rod handle along your forearm or actually even in your belly because these fish are large, the fights sometimes go for over 30 minutes, and shoulder fatigue is a huge issue for fishermen. So I what recommend the, uh, the switch rod. What about um, flies? What, what well, people have on? Uh, flies, these fish, when they first come in the river, are very aggressive. Eventually they'll start to spawn, and there'll be a lot of eggs in the water. Right now they're sorting out their mates that Square foot in front of their nose is very important to them right now. Anything that gets in there close to the bottom, they're, they're liable to strike. It is always presentation more important than the fly. So uh, any, particular color, any particular colors that are... Uh... Well, I have a couple of rules. Uh, and, and number one is low light chartreuse. When I go to the river first thing in the morning, I always have a chartreuse fly on, streamer, egg pattern, whatever. Even a nymph, I'll have a chartreuse, uh, uh, part, part of that fly will be chartreuse because they can see that. If it's cloudy chartreuse, when the stream is very clear, the sun's out, then your reds, your pinks, your oranges. And so I adjust throughout the day based on water clarity and, and the amount of uh, uh, sunlight. All right. Now, is there any particular time of the day that's better than another to fish for these? Early morning, especially right now, the early run, early morning is, is extremely uh, uh, important. Is it, is the spawn starts, then, you know, fish are moving in. There's numbers of fish. They're trying to position themselves. They're trying to get the, the sort out males and females. So any time of the day, but right now it's early morning. Uh, Rick, what's the best time of the fall to kind of get better? Or when does it reach its peak? Generally, it reaches its peak about, uh, you know, the early part of October. Um, as John, we start seeing in most general years when we have water, unlike this year. But, uh, you know, generally about the early part of October, you'll see the peak of the salmon run come in. Then as it goes on throughout October, start switching over to the steelhead, especially in the lower river. You'll still have a bunch of kings up in the upper end. Um, so generally about the early part of October is generally when it starts reaching its peak. Guys, you know, one thing that a beginner or someone from out of state needs to know is the rules and regulations about fishing for these salmon. Can you just bring up a couple things that 
people really, really need to know before they step foot in a stream or a river fishing for these salmon? Well, I would start out by a four foot leader because uh, that, that's been a rule for quite a long time now uh, from your weight to your fly can be no longer than four feet and that's to limit snagging. And when an officer checks you on the stream, he'll actually pull out a tape measure and if your leader is longer than four feet, you will get a ticket. Now, I'm not sure what, I, it's probably a $50 ticket, but it's an interruption in your day. So that four foot leader is extremely important. And you mentioned snagging. Snagging is not allowed, correct? No. <laughs> well, snagging was, there's a problem with snagging because we got these fish from Michigan years ago, late 60s, early 70s. Michigan had learned that you cannot allow snagging in the river system because then it's hard to get it out. People get used to fishing that way. They modify their techniques. They buy their equipment based on snagging. So we still have some of that in this system. And it, it, it's, a, it, it's a big fine. Uh, they can't take your tackle, but it, again, it interrupts your day. It's a frustration you don't want to deal with. And landing a 25 pound fish that is not hooked in the mouth, hooked in the belly of the tail, is a long, onerous process. And I don't think it's fun. Rick, is there any other law or regulation you think the uh, well, novice should know? Well, the one thing I'd, I'd like, you know, Delhi State is that any state park, uh, parking spot on this river, on the state sign, there's actually a box that has all the rules and regs in it yeah. for anybody to pick up. Just that way everybody's aware of that one. Um, but I mean, you know, like back to like Rock said about the snag, and that's the main one that really, you know, it's saying a foul hook fish. I mean, you know, if it's not legally hooked, there's a ton of fish out there. It's more enjoyable to show off a picture or take a fish home or tell someone about it that is fairly hooked and that you're able to actually have a really good fight with a fair hook fish. I mean, there's no fun and there's no use in killing these fish by fighting a foul hook fish or an illegal caught fish. So, now, I mean, you definitely. Just, yeah. just, just to clear this up. Now, a foul hook fish is a fish other than one hooked in the Correct. mouth. It's, right, if it's not in the mouth, which actually if you read the rule, the hook point must be facing out from the inside out of the mouth. So, I mean, technically, even if it's hooked right here along the jaw line, and the hook point is not, the hook is not within the mouth, inside the mouth, it's still considered a foul hook fish. Wow. Yep. And you can't keep it, of course, right? Correct. I mean, any foul hook fish, you have to release immediately without causing any further harm to the fish. Okay. Um, let's talk about the idea, because I know several people have, that I know have fallen in the river, and uh, it can get a little dicey. <laughs> they ain't all done that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can, can we chat about just some basics about fishing safely on the river? Rocky, you, you were quite adamant about talking about that. Well, I'm a retired guy, basically. I still do wounded warriors and, and, and military, but uh, for years, the first thing I ask a, a guest when he wants to schedule a trip, I say, I will not take you unless you show up with some type of cleat or stud system on your boots or waders. You cannot fish this river and enjoy yourself if you don't have a clean system on, on, on this river. And, you know, you can have a lot of fun up here. And you can have a great day and you can put fish on the bank. And then you're, you're walking out of the river at 4 o'clock and you take a fall. That ruins your day. So you really need to, and, and you can get hurt here. There's loose, uh, the depth changes abruptly. Uh, it's, it's a dangerous river if you're not prepared. Rick, you have anything you want to add to that? Well, definitely, like Rocky said, you know, you got to have some sort of cleats on the bottom of your shoes. I mean, if you don't feel stable on your legs, a walking stick is definitely a main priority that yeah. you should be carrying to keep stability in this water. You know, until, you know, if you're above your knees, you know, anything above your knees, you definitely want to be watching out as you're trying to cross or like that because this water sometimes can be fooling and, you know, just take your time and make sure that you have some stability. And there again, back to the cleats. I mean, definitely. And definitely have a waiter belt on your waders. So if you do, by chance, do fall in, it does stop the water from going down the waders, filling up, and causing you to sink. 
So, mm. I mean, definitely, but the main one is definitely something on the bottom of your boots like cleats. Okay. And the one thing, I guess, I want to talk about it. Some, someone told me once, you know, you get like combat fishing situations up there where people are side by side. Can we talk a little bit about stream etiquette or river etiquette? Rocky? Well, I, you know, I think that as a general rule on the river, you need to be at least one rod length away from the man next to you. And uh, I would say that's still a little pushing a little bit because you're throwing lower. Some of them are weighted. Some of these are, are large hooks with up to a half inch gap. So oh. if you are within a rod length, you're, you're kind of in a danger area. So I try to position people two rod lengths apart. And that's where I would start with etiquette. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to be sportsmen. So part of being a sportsman is taking care of each other and watching out for each other. Rick, you want you want to add to that or? Um, basically, like what Rocky said, you know, we're all out there to enjoy, you know, nature and enjoy the sport of fishing. So, you know, be courteous. Yeah, you know, I mean, if a guy's already fishing there, I mean, yeah, you might have fished there last week on that rock, but guess what? Somebody was there first. So, you know, walk up and ask some people, you know, hey, look, do you mind if I fish down below you? As long as there's room to where, like Rock said, two rod lengths away, so everybody has room. You know, if they say yes, hey, it's all about commodity and making friends out here on the water. So, you know, be courteous. You know, if you have to ask permission to hop in the pool with some guys, you know, hey, it never hurts to ask. If they say no, well, there's 13 miles of river. So you'll find a spot to be able to get to where you have room to fish and not, you know, get in someone's way or infringe on somebody else's space that they've already had or, you know, and be able to enjoy the same day of fishing as everybody else is. What about the dude who just wanders right into the middle of the pool? I mean, we've <laughs> all seen this. How do you deal with that? Well, you know, it, you, you approach somebody and, and, you know, if you're mad, if he's made you mad and you approach him and you're mad, that's where you, you get returned. So you really, you know, you try to pe treat people like you want to be treated. And like, you know, you, this is about, I think the, the best part of this fishery, they're big fish, right? We're outdoors, but there's camaraderie here. This salmon fishing, there's a lot of camaraderie. Like Rick says, if you come in and ask somebody, can I fish over here? Can I fish above you? Can I work in? I'm going to do everything possible to work a guy in. If, if my guests are going to step back and take a break, or take, I'm going to get somebody. If I see a 15-year-old kid, I'm going to bring him up and put him in that pool. And uh, Because if, when the day's over, it's all about fun. It's about smiles and the better we are to one another. And camaraderie is a huge part of what I do. Okay. So, okay, you're up there. You've never hooked a salmon before. You've done all the things you guys are talking about. And suddenly your rod is bending. And like, <laughs> whoa, whoa. you got one. <laughs> all right. Give me some tips on bringing that big fella in. Rick, start off. <laughs> Well, John, I can tell my clients, John, the first one you're going to lose. <laughs> but you're going to be so excited. But it's, uh, you know, the one thing is, is definitely these are not perched. They're not brook trout. So don't think you're going to reel them in right away. Um, let them run. That's what a drag is for. You know, let them tuck themselves out. And the one thing I'm going to state that goes with the safety and plus is don't run down the river. Remember, they can swim faster than that water, and you can run on those rocks. So, <laughs> stay safety to where you're not going to fall, break a rod, break a leg. Just walk slow. Um, it's basically, you know, work the rod angle so that way they're fighting low on the current plus the, you know, the angler. And, uh, like I said, just tuck them out. Hey, you wait all day to hook this fish, so enjoy it. <laughs> you know, so that's basically what I have for fighting the fish-wise is just, you know, enjoy the fight. Rocky? Well, yeah, uh, Rick's exactly right. You have to take your time with these fish. There's no way to speed up the process. Even if you move after them, you're not going to speed it up. You can come up here with a $29 fly reel, and fly reels do two things. They, they store line, and a $29 reel stores line as well as a $500 reel. So when you buy that $500 reel, you're buying a drag system. And so with these fish, as large as they are and as strong and, and the endurance these fish have is incredible. 
a drag system is key and essential. You cannot catch these fish by palm in the reel with a weak drag. You, got, you have to have a, a good drag system. And, and you, need to, uh, you need to be patient. There's, there's no way to hurry it up. What about beaching them versus netting them? Well, I personally I get prefer paid to put fish on the bank and, and, and have the guy take it home, so I'm going to carry a <laughs> net. But when I fish myself, I, I, I don't carry a net. I carry a fish glove and I tail them because I can release them so much easier and it's so much better for the fish. Yeah. Rick? You were, you I said Rocky. Same with Rocky. You know, I prefer a net. One, it definitely, you know, it does quicken the the end of the fight a little better so you don't have to beach them i mean there's been a lot of stuff been shown to where you know beaching them on rocks it can kill the fish especially if you plan on releasing them um if you are going to have to beach them which i don't suggest i suggest go out and spend the money for a net um or a tailing glove is try to find some water to where they're not going to bang their heads against the rocks i mean you know Especially if you plan on releasing this fish, I mean, you want to, you know, be able to be released and swim away to enjoy another day. So don't beach them on dry rocks. Don't chuck them on the bank. I mean, try to keep them somewhat still in the water. That's why I said, you know, buy a net or a landing glove so that way then you can keep them in the water so they're safe. You're not causing harm to the fish. I mean, you know, if you plan on keeping them, well, then as long as it's a fair hook fish, you know, then you can do what you want with it. But if you plan on releasing the fish, try to, you know, keep it safe and out of harm's way as best as possible by either net or landing glove. Okay, guys, it's my first salmon, and I want to bring it home and show my wife and kids, or at least bring something home. Um, what do I do now? It's, I've, I've netted it. It's on shore. I put it on the stringer. What do I do? Rocky? Well, I would uh... – you better have a big cooler and a lot of ice because these are big fins. <laughs> and, and, and I'm telling you, Rick will tell you too, it, it, at the end of October, when you oh. get into our cars, they stink. <laughs> because part of, we carry all that gear and we put it in the back. And so if you put a salmon in the back of your vehicle and he's not in a cooler, you're going to pay for that the next day. So, uh, but I'd recommend uh, my, my guests that they have something to put the, the, the fish in so he doesn't mess up their vehicle and go to immediately to one of the local uh, cleaning and smoking uh, uh, stations. And there's a number of good ones. Uh, it's just so, so much easier. You don't carry the mess home. And these people do this every day. They do hundreds every day and they're very good at it. And these, these fish are treat smoke. Rick, what does it cost? What's the what's the going rate for like filet um, here, smoking a, a salmon? Uh, here at the Pineville Sports Shop, I mean it's uh, like four dollars to fillet a fish. Uh, you know, smoking wise, I think it's already around about twenty dollars a fish plus the clean fee and uh, flavor fee. Um, I really don't deal a lot in it. I mean, most of my clients are all catch and release, but right. uh, we do have a clean station here at Pineville. But uh, you know, like I said you know it's it's somewhere around that ballpark of what it costs to get one cleaned. It's a, it's a lot easier to, hit, to bring it to the clean station because, um, let's face it, you got to get rid of the waste. Uh, instead, you're paying the four bucks to, for us to get rid of it for them. And basically, these cleaning stations are on all the Lake Ontario tributaries along the South Shore. Any place yes. you fish or salmon, you're going to find a cleaning station. In so, general aspects, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, North and South Sandy, you won't find one that I know of. I mean, don't call me on that one. There could be one, but I haven't heard of one up there for quite a while. But you can go up to Henderson or back down into, you know, the port or Plaskat to find a clean station. 